we're going to start off uh, just very briefly, actually back in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, you may remember this, but there are, uh, back in chapter 23, I'll write this down so you might remember. Okay, so back in Matthew 23, Jesus has this encounter with the Pharisees, and we call that encounter the seven woes. Okay, so it's this like deep conflict. You guys remember that. And then in, um, so it's going through all of the woes and then chapter 23 ends with Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. Um, and so Jesus is, you know, he's devastated. His heart is for his people. His heart is for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And they're clearly not getting it. And then at the very beginning of chapter 24, Will touched on it, is this uh, little section. So Jesus calls out all the Pharisees. There's the seven woes. He's basically telling them all the things that they're doing wrong and all the destruction that's coming their way if they don't shape up. Then he's lamenting over Jerusalem. And then it's this really strange transition because after all that, at the very beginning of chapter 24, it says this. So Jesus left the temple and was going away. So all this just happened. And it says this. When his disciples came to point out to him basically how awesome the buildings are. It's like very odd. It's very odd that all this stuff happens and then the disciples don't know what to do. So they're like, hey, Jesus, how about that architecture, right? And he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will, be not, uh, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So he basically says that there is going to be an event or a series event or something where this place is going to be destroyed. Do you remember this? Today... I want to pick up where Will left off because chapter 24 is really the context of this question. And the question that the disciples have is when? This is the context of all of chapter 25. When are these things going to happen? And so Jesus goes into chapter 24 about his return. What do you guys remember about chapter 24 and, and the return of the king or the return of the son of man, as Matthew likes to say? Nobody knows when. Okay, so nobody knows when. They want to know the exact date, and Jesus says nobody knows. What else does he say? You got to talk loud. I got my back turned. Okay, the father knows. Only fa the father he does tell them that there's going to be some things that happen, though, right? What are those things? Some darkness. Okay, so there's going to be like some uh, like natural signs that something is not right. So natural signs. What's that? War, War and violence, destruction. Yeah, there's going to be lots of people who claim that they're uh, prophets, so false prophets. COVID-19. Uh, which strand, doctor? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's all these things going to happen. He also uh, uh, says in there that, the, that uh, nations are going to rise up against you for speaking the truth, right? So there's this idea already, even though it hasn't been said yet, that you're going to go out into the nations to tell them about me, and some of them are really not going to like it. So all of this stuff is going to happen. But the ultimate conclusion of chapter 24 is this. We don't know when. So the, this is where we're coming from in chapter 24. And I think personally that chapter 24, 25 begins and is really building towards what do you do in this time? If we don't know when, and it could be any time Jesus could return, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? That's kind of an important question, isn't it? If Jesus has called us to be faithful and obedient to him, he said that I am going to come back, I'm going to set things right, there's going to be all these signs and wonders and all sorts of stuff that's going to happen, and you're like, well, that sounds brutal and violent and awesome and beautiful and all that stuff in one, when is that going to happen? And he says... Nobody knows. I think last week or two weeks ago, Will showed you a video of, uh, what's that guy's name? I shouldn't laugh, but do you remember what his name is? Uh, the old, old guy, he had a radio station. He kept predicting the world and he kept being wrong. What's his name? I can't remember. Anyways. Uh, yeah, he says, 
be wary of people who want to predict the date and the time, only the Father knows. So chapter 25 is all about what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Like right now, like what are we supposed to do? So I want to erase the board and before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about maybe like what the world or maybe more specifically kind of like Christian culture has taught or embedded into Christians about what you're supposed to do while you wait. So you can use kind of the stereotypes of some extreme denominations or anything you want, but what has kind of Christian culture broadly sort of told certain parts of Christianity that we're supposed to do while we wait? Okay, share the gospel. It's like a real timid one. I feel like everyone can agree on that. Okay, be ready, yeah. That's a good one. What does it mean to be ready? How many of you know or have been around kind of the culture of we should insulate ourselves, keep the world out? Um, we should not interact with the world out there. We need to basically create a spiritual bunker. We are ourselves, just us, and we don't interact with the outside world because Jesus is coming back soon. How many of you have been around that or know people who are like that? Okay, so that definitely exists. How many of you have been around people and then you're surprised to know they're a Christian because you're like, in the meantime of waiting, it doesn't seem like you're doing anything. Anybody been around those sorts of people? Any other examples you can think of? Okay, so there is a wide range. That's what I want to see. There's a wide range, and I think Jesus has laid it out in his word what we are supposed to do, at least the principles of what we're supposed to do. So let's jump into uh, chapter 25. Um, I'm going to read each. There's three kind of main sections. I'm going to read them all in their completion. I think uh, it's important for how they're written to read them in their completion, and then we'll kind of circle back and, and pull them apart together. So it says this, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they went to sleep. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Anybody know the Johnny Cash song, Trimming Their Wicks? You guys know that one? You should look it up. It's a good one. Sorry. <laughs> Verse 8. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. There it is again. In case these disciples are falling prey to somebody telling them, we know when Jesus is going to come back, what does he say? You know neither the day nor the hour. Okay, there's a lot going on in the story. I think um, there's some important things to kind of tackle before we can really dive into it. The first is like this whole weird setup. Anybody else feel like it's really weird that Jesus is talking about like 10 virgins? Anybody just think that's like a weird setup to a story? I, I feel like it's a little bit strange. It doesn't seem like this is normally how Jesus teaches. Um, and you can just do a quick little search and realize what Jesus is saying is actually something super common and super easy for people in the first century to understand, and it's a little bit foreign to us. So uh, this idea when we start reading about bridegrooms and virgins, like, I think some of the questions if you go on the internet are like, are all 10 of these women supposed to be his wife? Like, that seems odd, right? And if not, what, what is it? talking about? Why does it describe them like that? It sounds, seems like in a, a culture like ours that I, I would argue is like hypersexual, we read that and we think like, what is going on here? This is like polygamy or something weird. So here's what's really going on. I think I put a footnote, but let me paint this picture for you. Uh, there was a kind of a custom or a series of customs that led up to a wedding feast. Many of you know this from Joseph and Mary. There was kind of a, a betrothal or like an engagement process. 
And what would happen is uh, families would get together and they would negotiate or whatever they would do, and they would decide that my son and your daughter are going to get married. They would meet with one another, they would basically give the thumbs up, we're gonna get married, and then what would they do? They would separate usually for nine months to a year. And what was happening in that time period in the ancient world, a young man was now 100% with his dad. He was probably already with his dad, but now he's doing it with kind of tunnel vision that out, now I'm going to, say I'm a fisherman, I'm gonna have to move out of your boat and be my own man. I'm gonna have to provide for a family, and so now I'm paying attention to every detail that you can teach me. Uh, a wife is now being, in the Jewish world, being shared things that, that wives know that young girls don't, and she is learning the process of what will be expected to, of you in the Jewish world. So when it's talking about virgins, this is where this custom comes in. After that period of nine months or a year, the wedding is going to begin, and what would happen is the groom would take a handful of his, mostly his relatives. I, I like to almost think of them as like groomsmen, but they're not. They're relatives. They're close men in his family. And he would go to collect his bride. And when he would go to collect his bride, it was customary that the bride knew that he will be coming. They don't know exactly when, but they know he's coming soon. So she would uh, gather her closest young female relatives, this is the ten virgins, and they would be the ones to keep the lookout to let the bride know that your groom is approaching. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so this is the scene. Now, there's something huge that's left out of here, and that is, who is the bride? Anybody notice that? Yeah! <laughs> Isn't this brilliant? Matthew doesn't come out and say, also, like, in brackets, the reason I have not told you who the bride is is because you, the church, are the bride. This is the piecing things together and connecting the dots. If you're paying attention, you got what Kevin said. If you're not paying attention, you're confused. Does that make sense? Okay, so these women are the women responsible, and their job is a big one. Their job is to shout or to alert the bride that the groom is approaching. Get ready. The feast is about to start. This is a big deal. This is an honor and shame world. And how you, are, um, how you are presented when the groom shows up, how the party is ready to be kicked off, is basically the social event of a lifetime for a family. How this gets pulled off can bring great honor to a family or great shame to a family. And so Jesus splits it right down the middle. He says there's five of them that are wise and five of them that are foolish. So let's talk about them. Okay. So they go, it says, they went to uh, meet the bridegroom. And they took their lamps with them because there's a possibility that maybe he comes in the middle of the night. Sounds fair enough. It says, but five of them didn't take much oil with them. And five of them, more or less, packed like a costco size oil, so they're not going to run out. But then the bridegroom was delayed. So maybe there was this anticipation that he's, he's already on his way. And then he doesn't show up. And so what does it say? It says, they all became drowsy and slept. I think this is an important uh, chunk to notice. Which, one of, which ones go to sleep? All of them. So they all sleep. Now, if we're just reading this, like, really quickly, like, frankly, I, I've done many times, you're just reading it quickly, you immediately think, like, oh, no, you don't want to go to sleep. You want to be prepared. But do you notice something about sleeping? Does the bridegroom chastise or get angry with them for sleeping? No. It's midnight, after all. You should be able to sleep, right? So sleeping is not the problem. What is the problem? Being prepared. So there's something about preparation. I love this because I feel like it's culture clash. When we read it, we kind of cringe and cower because it sounds like mean. You know, we're not supposed to be mean. We're supposed to be nice, right? When you go to school, make sure you're nice, right? I'm positive that the ancient world doesn't give a rip about being nice, like zero. What they care about is when you're on the playground today, make sure you bring honor to our family. 
right? That's this culture. They're not the be nice. So the reason that the five are wise is simple. It's because they have oil and they brought enough. So there's an element of this story that kind of goes like this, I think. It's the sleeping and growing drowsy. I think this is just a human reaction. We're human beings, right? You get sleepy. The, the point is not that you can't go to sleep. It's that before you give in to sleep, that you should be prepared. That you should anticipate that all sorts of things could happen. For instance, the king, the son of man could return at any moment. And so even though that we go to sleep, if we have to sit right up and jolt out of bed, we're prepared. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, Let's, let me flip the page here and make sure. Okay. Um, I wrote this down. This is my takeaway and my margins. I wrote that uh, spiritual preparedness is not something that you can transfer to another person. So what do they say? They say, well, wait a second. We forgot our oil. Let us have some of yours, right? It, and I think we can look in, into that and say like, well, that's reasonable. Just give them a little bit of oil. Or how about this? We don't have enough oil for you and for us, right? Why don't you just huddle in super close to us and our light can light the way for all of us? You see that? I think that's how we start to think. Our American mind starts to think, how can we accommodate everyone? How can we be nice? But what do the wise say? More or less they say, sorry, but it's not our problem. We prepared for a wedding feast. We prepared for what's expected of us to see the groom coming and jolt awake and be ready for him. You did not. You're going to have to run off to the store and get your own oil. And so they get left behind. It says this, that while they were going to buy more oil, the bridegroom did come, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. Now, the, these young women who get to go to the marriage feast, the second they start their attendance there, they are bringing honor to their family. Their name is now attached to this big social event in the ancient world. And the door was shut. And afterwards, the other ten, or the other five came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Does that sound like another scripture to you? Yeah. Which one is it? I don't know. I don't, it just sounds familiar. <laughs> I like your honesty, Kev. <laughs> yeah, what is the story? It's when um, they, uh, he's telling the story of the wise man and the foolish man on what they build upon, whether it's a rock or sand. And it comes down to the fact that um, the people that come to him and ask um, to come in, they say, we prophesied in your name, we've done good things in your name. And he says, um, I don't even know you. Yeah. Because you didn't practice what I said, you practice lawlessness. And you'll have to depart. And then he gives the illustration of the uh, building on the rock or the sand. Yeah, so he says the exact same words. He says, not all who say, Lord, Lord, are going to be invited in, right? Yeah, 7, 21 through 23. So I, I think, I think here's, here's the point, is that your actions reveal who you think he is. So the fact that you have no oil is not just that you don't have oil and now you can't see him coming. It's if you knew who he was, if you truly knew who he was, then your natural reaction would be to be prepared for this and you're not prepared. So this is not just you have to like procrastinate and now you have to rush for oil. It's this whole time you haven't been expecting him and so you haven't been preparing as is necessary. Does that make sense to everyone? Any, uh, any questions or thoughts on um, this particular story? Yeah, Ricardo. Yeah. Well, that was going to be in my main takeaway, but just like Chester, you like to steal all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, throughout the whole Bible, like even to this day, we anoint people with oil, right? The ones with oil cannot just take the anointing of God and just say like, well, you have it right? That's not how this works. There's not like, a, I'll pour you half of my oil so now you can have it. It's either you have it or you do not have it. And that's, 
how this works. And so the anointing is, um, it, it's, it's not just something that you can have a half measure of, and it's not something that you just get last minute because you forgot about it and now God is gonna bail you out. Now this is a hard lesson because I, I think there is a whole movement even in Christian culture who hates this message. It's not a nice one to speak. But God is not in the business, the Bible is not in the business of bailing people out at the last minute because they just forgot and they didn't do anything. People who recognize him for who he is are allowed in and people who do not are left outside. And it, you know what, I think, I think the, uh, well, I think it's the next story, but we hear these, these things like you'll be left in the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think there's a whole movement in the world that would like to get rid of those scriptures because it sounds mean, it's not inclusive. This is not about what is inclusive or exclusive. Uh, I heard um, a professor once say that um, if this was about being inclusive, inclusive or exclusive and it was about God being fair, what God would say is forget the whole project of humankind, they're all in the outer darkness and they can all weep and gnash their teeth. That's what is deserving. So this is about God I I inviting those who recognize him, that choose to follow and listen to him, being included and welcomed in. And it comes across as sharp and mean, but uh, I don't think that's what the story is about at all. Andy, uh, yes? I was reading um, a Messianic theologian, and he was saying that um, this is also a message to Israel. Those who are ready and those who are not, he has just left over Jerusalem. And that he's speaking to his disciples, he's speaking to the Jews. And we have a tendency to work our way down 2,000 years to where we're at here in the church, but this is a heavy message to Israel, again, that those who accept him, know who he is, and are ready for them, will go in when he comes, but there is a vast majority that thinks they're ready, they have a lamp, they have a little oil, but they don't know him, and they're not prepared, and they will not go in. Yeah. That, that was kind of interesting that that was his take on part of this. So I, I, think, I think what you're saying is um, fully registering. I think if we just go all the way back to the basics of how Jesus lays out the story is this. There is a groom. We clearly understand who the groom is because they're asking, when are you coming back? And now the story is about a groom who's not here and now he's going to be here. So who is the groom? The groom is Jesus. And it's clear that he comes, and the whole story is set up culturally, to he's coming to get his bride. He's coming to get his bride, and they're going to a wedding feast. That's what's going to happen. So the question is, who else gets to go to the wedding feast? And I think that's what this is about. The who gets to go to this wedding feast is not, you're Jewish, so you're in. But it's also not, you saw me at the Jordan River and heard me teach once, so you're in. It's about who recognizes who I am and who prepares in their waiting for me to come. Because when I come and I find you prepared, then guess what? You're in. And it's going to be a feast. There's a reason Revelation uses this image, right? It's this grand banquet. And Jesus says, do you know how many people can be in? As many as there possibly can be, that's part of what you do in the waiting. We haven't got there yet. Part of what you do in the waiting is you bring the message to the nations, right? And he says, there's so much room that my, my house has a mansion for all, right? There's plenty of room, but the way you get in is not because you're Jewish and your, your great-great-grandfather was related to Abraham. It's not because you're a good person or a good guy. It's because you recognize me for who I am am and you obey and part of what Jesus is teaching these disciples in real time is what do you do in the waiting you prepare you prepare accordingly you this is where I was going to end you preserve your anointing We talked about this the last few weeks in Exodus. The idea of anointing technically is like a smear, but it's, it's a marking that you belong to God. 
It's the mark that I am God's, I am God's beloved, and I'm going to live accordingly. And I think this is what the story is. The oil is that you live a life that says, I'm preserving the anointing. I'm going to obey Jesus. I'm going to abstain from the things of the world. And I'm going to be prepared so when he comes, even if I'm sleeping, I wake up and say like, oh, he's here. I'm prepared for this. That's what this is all about. So I think the first answer to the question, what do we do in the waiting, is that we are prepared. We are prepared by preserving that we belong to God, that we take that very seriously, and we uh, live that out every single day of our lives. And when we don't, we repent, and we are welcomed right back in. That's the whole message. I was thinking about this because I was uh, writing out the outline, and I was thinking, there's going to come a time. I don't, I don't feel like I'm totally there yet, but you know, you get to this time where you're like, that baby due date is in like two weeks. It could literally happen any minute, right? And it doesn't matter if you just look online or you go to one of the classes you have to pay $600 to go to. Well, one of the first things they're going to say is, pack a bag for the baby, pack a bag for mom, leave it by the door. Because when that moment comes, whoosh, you got to be prepared. I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, that's a physical reality to be prepared for that. Am I spiritually that prepared for Jesus to come back? And to be honest, the answer when I asked myself the question was mostly no. Luckily, God accepts repentance and forgiveness and puts our feet back on the ground in the right direction. Uh, any, other, any other questions or thoughts? I'm not trying to rush us through. I just have to tell you this second of third three stories is like I'm very excited about. It. I just feel like I didn't even know this, what it really was all about, and I learned it this week, so I'm excited. I don't want to cut anyone off. Are we good to move on? Cool. Okay. For it will be, and what is it? Yeah. So the big question is, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, I can't tell you the exact moment because I don't know. Only the Father knows. But when it does happen, it will be like this. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. I want to pause right here. So this culture is an honor and shame culture. So right off the start, I think what first century hearers are hearing is somebody who owns like land uh, and he's definitely wealthy or well-to-do enough to have servants is going to take what he owns and he's going to entrust that to a servant. Now on the social hierarchy in the first century, where do these two groups of people stand? We got a perceived kind of land owner. So where is he at? He's at or near the top. And now we have servants or slaves. Where are they? They're at the very bottom. So even how the story is set up, it says he's going to entrust his property to them. This in the ancient world is like, wow. Right off the top, these people have a tremendous opportunity to earn honor for themselves based on whatever is going to happen next. So to one, he gave five talents. To another two and to another one, to each according to his ability, then he went away. Let's pause here for a second. You know, I, I, this drives me nuts sometimes because we talk and we argue. Literally before you came in here, I was talking with someone at the back row of the sanctuary about like Bible translations. People fight and they argue over what these words mean. And then every now and then we get this word that literally they're like, Meh, we don't know. So we'll just write it in English exactly how it is in Greek. So this word talent really unfortunately gets translated into English. In um, Greek, it's pronounced like uh, ta len ta. That's it. And we just translate it. Oh, looks like the word talent. The only issue is talent is already an English word, so it's very easy to read this and think, one guy is super talented and one guy only has one talent, <laughs> right? And in a second, he's going to have no talent. He's going to be the untalented young man. So let's talk about it for a second. Um, I first read some commentaries about what this is, and when I read it, I thought, well, if you know what it is, why don't you just translate it as that? And it turns out there's a conflict, as there are many, many things. A talent is not money, it turns out. I actually didn't know this. A talent is not money. It's a unit of measure. It's a weight measure. This is kind of back 
but some of you guys like this stuff. So it's a unit of measure, like you put it on the scale and it's measuring something. Now here's the problem, is that you could look it up and you could find scholars all over the map who are gonna say that this is, this represents something between one and 20 years of a day laborer's wages. So this is like one to 20 years salary. That's how much one of these is. Does that make sense to everyone? Now the reason there's a conflict is because the weight of measure depends on the year because every time Rome strikes coin, depending on how they're doing, they might put more or less silver or gold in it. They might put like other alloys. And so when you put it on the scale, it will weigh more or less. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's where the discrepancy is. But here's the deal. Whether it's one or 20, I actually think a lot of people are saying that it's right about 10 years. So I'm gonna, just for the sake of cohesion, let's just say it's this for the story, but also recognize this might be wrong. So one talent equals 10 years pay. A lot of money, a little bit of money. A ton of money, especially to be entrusted to someone who gets one denarius per day. That's basically enough to eat bread, drink, maybe have a blanket or two, and then wake up with no money the next day and do it again. So all of a sudden, this is what happens. These guys are entrusted, if we do the math, five talents, 50 years worth of salary. Yikes, that's a lot of dough, right? Second guy gets two talents, so he gets how much? 20, and the last guy gets 10. I think, I, I'm just thinking bags of gold. His, Got a ton of dough all of a sudden. Okay, and he gives them each according to his ability. Now that's not allowed to be said anymore, right? This is the every kid gets a trophy, but it turns out right off the start, whoever owns this property says like, I know each of you, you're each different, and so when it comes to my property, as the one who owns it, I'm gonna entrust each of you a little differently. So let's see how this pans out. Uh, Let's see, then he went away, verse 16. He who had received the five talents, so the guy who got the most, it says, went at once and he traded them and he made five talents more. Now I, I learned this this week, but it's, it, it more or less is insinuating that right away he gets to the trading and the bartering or whatever he's doing, but it doesn't mean that he goes away and then immediately in one day comes back with five more. It just means that he gets started right away. Okay, um, so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. So he's doubling the investments. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Interesting. Um, I, I, I saw this randomly and I thought it was worth a footnote, but this, um, this hiding this digging and this hiding word, it only appears I think one other time in Matthew and it's the story of a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Would you ever take a, a lamp and put it under a basket? So the, I think there's a, a connection that whatever this guy's doing is taking the light that's entrusted to him and just hiding it. So he buries it, puts it in the ground. Now after a long time, it's an interesting word, so they're asking, when is this going to happen? And Jesus says, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The word settled accounts is not like, give me what's owed. It's uh, more of like, a, let's meet together and see what happened. I entrusted it to you. Let's see what, what you did with it. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. So 50 years worth of money. Here, I've made 50 more years worth of money for you. Verse 21, and the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, so I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We're gonna see in a second, and I, I might forget, so I wanna just point it out. The master is actually going to give this guy his money back. He's just gonna let him have it. Uh, in a second, he's gonna take the one talent from the guy who dug it in the ground and says, just give it to the guy who has 10. So this is not about the master somehow cashing out based on what you've done. There's something else. And the reward is what? I think our, our like economy wants to shape us. We're like, the guy made 50 years more worth of money. That's his reward. 
But what is the reward? Yeah. He doesn't say, great job, you're very shrewd, you should run a hedge fund. He doesn't say that. He says, great job. With what I entrusted to you, you were faithful with it. Now enter into my joy. That's, I just think that's a beautiful thing. I'm not a tattoo guy, but if I was, I'd consider that. And he also, uh, and he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered me two talents here. I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. By the way, he says, you have been faithful over a little. Does that register to anyone? Because I would argue, you just gave him 50 years worth of dough, and now you're saying, you've been faithful over a little. What does this say about the master? He's not impressed by 50 years worth of salary. He considers that a little amount. And of course, we're not talking about real money. This is, uh, this is a parable. So what we're learning is about the master. Number one, he is much more concerned with what you did with it than what you got in return. The reward is that you get to come into his joy. And also this little thing that he considers that a little. Like he has so much that this is just a little. And he's just impressed that you took what he gave you and you proved yourself faithful. Okay. <laughs> So he said, um, good and faithful, you've been faithful over a little, I'll set you over much, enter into the joy of the master. Verse 20, 24, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you can have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. Here, here's 10 more years worth of money. You can have it. For to everyone who has will more be given. And he who will have, uh, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whoa. On first blush, Jesus is mean, isn't he? Isn't that what it first looks like? So let's talk a little bit about this. So the big question, this whole section, is about what do we do while we wait? So what do we do while we wait? And this story is another story about what we do while we wait. And this is what it says. It says that he comes and he entrusts the property to varying degrees according to ability. I love this, actually. You know what, I, uh, I think sometimes in our world, especially kind of where it's going in the last 15 years or so, uh, what's really odd to me is I was prior to the every kid gets a trophy generation, I can remember actually crying because I went to, uh, where I grew up, there was different levels of Little League baseball. There was like uh, T-ball, then the next level was called the farm or farm. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Half the season is the pitching machine and then you slowly shift to kids actually pitching the ball. The next level is called minors. And minors is the first time that in my town you enter the draft. If you, guys, you guys probably know this better than I do. And then it went like majors, majors two, juniors, seniors. That's how it was and then you went to high school. Miners won was the first time you came, you got given a 30 minute time slot, they had you try first base, take grounders, do hitting practice, all that stuff. And then all the coaches came and they just took notes and they're like, thanks for coming Andy, we'll, uh, we'll give you a call in a week. And then you hear that these adults, these terrifying adults with the clipboard took notes and they're trying to win the game and so what do they do? They draft the best players, right? And you find out that in a team of 11, I was like the eighth round, which means if there's eight teams, I was like the 60th pick out of 90, right? So basically the first thing you learn is like, man, I gotta improve a lot. But what I'm saying is by the time my littlest brother, who's eight years younger than me went through it, that's not how it worked anymore. 
every kid got a trophy and after a certain score there was like a mercy rule so you didn't have to lose that bat and cry about it because I remember getting blown out by like 40 runs and they're like sorry we're just going to keep piling it on you you guys stink and we're going to let you know but I think I think there's an element of protecting children from being blown out by 40 runs but there's also an element of everybody's nice everybody's kind everybody's equal and I think in some sense that comes from a beautiful good place but what Jesus is saying is you're not equal and that's not a bad thing. I think what Jesus is saying is, according to your ability, you are different. You come from different backgrounds. You have different abilities. You ha have different personalities and passions and interests and skills. And taking into account who you are because I know you, I'm going to entrust you with different things. It's as simple as that. It's not a comparison. Do you notice the guy who only got two talents and the guy who got five talents got the exact same reward at the end? And it's not because God is just giving out trophies. It's because they took what was entrusted to them and they acted faithfully with it. That's it. That's all that's required. They don't have to take grounders at shortstop and look like an idiot when they're eight, you know? That was my story, not theirs. So, he says, each according to their ability. I love that the first guy, the guy who is entrusted with the most, he immediately shows why he's entrusted with the most because what does it say he does? He goes at once, it says. At once, he just gets right to work. I recognize that this is a tremendous honor, that the master has entrusted me with something that he thinks I'm worthy of, and I want to prove to him that I am worthy of it. I'm going to get to work immediately. And so he doubles what's given to him. The second guy goes, and he too doubles it. And I love this, because now one guy has four talents and one guy has ten. And Jesus, the master doesn't say, oh man, I'm going to throw a banquet for the guy with 10. The guy who got four, I'm going to let him keep a little for his hard work, a pretty good job. He says, both, you get to enter my joy. You are invited to the wedding from the last parable you're in. But then it says in verse 18 that one guy, he buries it in the ground. Let me make a note for myself here. Okay, let's talk about this guy because he says some pretty pointed, mean things directly to the master's face. Anybody in here like the super confrontational personality? Anybody? No? I have a friend that's like relatively confrontational and we always laugh in retrospect. We sometimes fight with each other, but we laugh because he gets extra confrontational when he knows he's wrong. And I think that's this guy. This is what happens. He buries it in the ground. He comes, the master comes back and says, where's, what would you do? And he digs it up and says, here, you can have what's yours. But what does he say? He, it seems like he accuses the master of something. What does he say? You are a hard man. This, uh, in, in, we've talked about this, this hard and stiff necked are kind of the same exact word. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Uh, hard to change. Yeah, it means like he's being accused of like you are stubborn or you're proud or something like that. That's what he's uh, accusing him of. And so why does he accuse him of that? What does he say you do? You reap where you don't sow, you where you don't sow and you... Yeah. Okay, now let's take a step back and think about this. We are living, this Bible story is living in a culture where everybody's entire life depends on what? The harvest, right? There's a reason that when the harvest is bad, there are huge famines and a ton of people die in the ancient world because a harvest is a huge deal. Now, if you are a servant and you are working for a master, what kind of master are you hoping you get? First and foremost, does he have to be nice? It would be awesome if he was. But what is the number one thing you want to make sure he is? He's what? Good at what he does. Yeah, he's good at what he does. And what does he do? He knows how to farm, yeah. right? Because when it hits the fan and everybody else is having trouble, if your guy is leading the farm and he's kind of in charge of this project and he knows where to send people to water and knows how to send people to irrigate and, and do all the stuff that farms do, and then at the end of the year your harvest is good, guess what that means for you? You get to eat. That's number one. Now if he's nice, that would be great too, but that's like totally secondary, right? 
So what does he accuse him of? You reap crops where you don't even sow the seed. What is he, like, it's backwards. So what is he accusing him of? You're too good at farming. That's what he's saying. In the ancient world, wouldn't it be nice to put in very little effort and poof, stuff grows out of the ground? So what is he saying? You're too successful. That's kind of what he's saying. I, um, that's what I always thought, but then I was challenged this week because I said that to a friend and he said, well, if this is about God, is God opportunistic in stealing crops from someone else? Or is there something else going on? This is what I think is going on. I, I'm willing to be you know, challenged. This is what I think. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll just own it for everyone else. There is something in our human spirit when we see somebody who's very successful. Maybe they drive a super nice car or maybe they have like a really nice watch on. Maybe they're just like always have their hair or their nails done, whatever it is. And what is often a human's first reaction to that? Is it, wow, you must be really good at what you do and you work really hard. No, we are the comparison people. It's what we've been doing since the beginning of time. So what is often, you know, like your friend who struggles, what is their reaction? It's, I bet that guy's, a, I bet that guy cheats. I, yeah, I, things come easy to him. I bet he cuts corners. I bet he's one of these guys who doesn't really pay his taxes, right? So what are you really doing? You, or they're in tremendous debt and they're good at hiding it. <laughs> no, we, we play this game. It's this comparison game. And when we see somebody, it's jealousy. It's, that's what it is, right? It's jealousy. What is this guy jealous of? He's got lots to be jealous of right now. Is he excited that he was just given one talent, 10 years worth of pay? Now, I think he is very similar to, do you remember the parable of when um, the guys are hired at different times and they come get their pay? If there was no other people and the master said, hey, you, come here, I want to entrust you with my property. Here's one talent, now go. And there was no one to compare it to, do you think this guy would be upset? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. If he is upset, he'd be less upset. Because now he has to look and say, like, well, why is that guy got five and why is that guy got two? I know why. I bet they're in cahoots with this guy, and he, he's so successful, he's got to be cheating, right? So he gets accused of the thing that every servant would want. You're really good at providing for the people in your care. That's what he accuses him. By the way, I'm still not sponsored by Spindrift. I don't know if you guys knew that. Okay, let me flip the page here. Okay, so that's what he's accusing him of. So... It seems like the master does not push back. He doesn't say, that's not true. I, I don't do those things. What does he say? But the answer, uh, the, the uh, master answered, verse 26, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was uh, my own with interest. So he's presenting like, I'm afraid of you. You're so successful. I was just afraid of you. I'm just like the little tiny guy who was only entrusted one thing and I didn't know what to do, so I buried it in the ground. I think this is the same kind of outcome of the last story, and it's, in my opinion, it's this. What's really going on is none of this jealousy, pride, stubbornness stuff. It can just be boiled down to this. If this guy knew who the master was, he would understand that to be given a gift like this is a tremendous honor. That's what it is. In this culture, to take this tremendous honor and bury it in the ground is to say, I'll show you what I think of you based on what I do with the honor you've given to me. So he buries it in the ground. He clearly doesn't understand the master. Maybe he has anxiety about what if I make an investment that goes south or what if I lose the money. But listen, if he knew the, the master, he would know, what is the master requiring? Is he requiring a, a return on my investment? Or is he requiring that I am faithful with what I have? Let me give you a, a tangible, real example. Is it possible that God gives somebody maybe a gift of evangelism? Maybe it's one of those people that is like, I just want to share my faith so much. I'm going to go down into the orange circle and share my faith. 
shares faith, right? And nobody listens. Are they squandering their gift? Is God upset that there's no return on investment? Why? You could look in and say, it's not doing anything. But if that person is saying, this is what I've been called to and I'm just obedient, that's it. I'm just going to be obedient to what I'm called to and the outcome is up to God, then that person understands who God is. That's where this guy gets it wrong. He doesn't understand who God is. He doesn't understand that what he's been given, he just needs to go be faithful with it. So instead he gets afraid of it, he buries it in the ground, he makes up a stupid excuse that you're too good at farming, you're too good at caring for people, so I'm afraid of you. I don't understand you as the provider. I understand you as somebody to be feared. I totally don't get you. And therefore, what ends up happening to him, he's left out. He's one of the five virgins who forgot the oil, and they're on the outside looking in. It says he is in the outer darkness, the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is that ugly cry where you're weeping and mourning the loss of something, where you've got the ugly body shake cry going on. Andy, yeah. statement with that particular parable, and I think it fits here, and you said, actions reveal who you believe he is. Yeah. And I think we see that his actions reveal what he believes the master is. Yeah. And that really equates even to our lives. If we think he is a fearful, vindictive, demanding God, we will not serve him with freedom and joy. And we'll bury what we have because we're afraid of him. So yeah. that very thing that you said that happened with the virgins is happening here. His actions reveal who he believes his master is. Yeah. And in this culture brings him tremendous shame that to the master in this culture, master, you're so dumb that you would entrust 10 years of pay to a guy who doesn't know what to do with it. You clearly don't know what you're doing. You clearly don't know how to manage people. That's basically what this guy is communicating. Now, I think what happens is the, the two stories kind of collide. So the, the question is, in the first story, what do we do while we wait? The, the 10 virgins story, we said it was to be prepared. What would you say this story is telling us to do while we wait? While we wait for Jesus to return, what are we supposed to be out here doing? Like, what, what are we here doing? Work, okay? What kind of work? Go out and make disciples. Yeah. I think there's a great commissioning that's going on for the, uh, the apostles. And I think to varying degrees, we are all part of that. But just like these guys, are we all the same? Are we all, uh, clearly we don't all have the same gifts or talents or interests or passions. We're not even the same ages. We don't have the same histories and backstories. We don't have the same like traumas and hangups or successes and, and you know, we're all different. So what is our job? It's to, it's what? Use yeah, use our abilities. Use what God gave us. What did God give, give us? He gave us everything. Gave you personality. Gave you your social skills or lack thereof, right? He, huh? Life. Life. Yeah, I wrote down some examples because I, I think that sometimes we think of these in big, broad, streeping strokes. Just last week, we had a camp here for 50 kids, right? And I was thinking about this because uh, while we were at bait camp this year, Krista tracked down this photo that she put on the screen to encourage the kids. How many, was anybody at bait camp? A couple. Do you guys remember the photo she put up? It's 10-year-old Krista baking a cake. And you can just see on her face that in that moment, she loved baking cake. Do you guys see the photo, right? Okay, so what is the gift? It's very specific. She loves baking, right? Okay, awesome. Now what would the world say that you should do with that gift? You should bake, right? I don't know, maybe occasionally make some cupcakes for your friends. That'd be awesome, right? So uh, she would be so embarrassed if she knew I was talking about her right now. So flash forward, Krista owns a bakery, so this is now a business, right? How many of you have ever ordered cupcakes or anything from Krista? How many of you have felt like she has blessed you in more ways than one by doing that, right? Okay, that is using the gift, but it's not done yet because then she has this idea like four or five years ago, what if we just took this and tried somehow, I don't know if this is even a thing, but a baking camp so instead of a storefront where I sell cupcakes, a place where I could teach kids to bake, 
but we can tell them about Jesus while they're here. That is a tremendous example of God gave you a gift and a passion. How do you use it in a way that brings honor to God? Is that, is that amazing? I was thinking of a, a couple other ideas. I was thinking about um, somebody I know, and I'm not going to use their names because they'd be even double embarrassed, but I know somebody who goes to church here, and every single time I walk through their front door, there's just something about their house where you just do this thing, like, <sighs> it's almost like you had a massage just by walking in. Like, I, I have so many things to be stressed out and worried about, but I left them on the other side of the door, right? What? You... you didn't even know I was coming and you're already whipping something up delicious to drink or eat and now you're in like, I don't know why, but your sofa is just more comfortable than other people's sofas, right? How many of you know that person and their home is just a place of hospitality? It's like a refuge place. How many of you know that person? Yeah. And usually those people with the door closed, they know their house is like that. And the reason it's like that is because they know God gave them the gift of hospitality and they've been praying into it. God, when people come in here, we want them to feel at ease and free to be themselves, right? Um, some people are really, really good at words. Some of you actually in this room have written me letters. Um, there is somebody who, not every time, but uh, every other time or so that I preach, they write me a handwritten letter. Sometimes like multiple pages. It's like, you. this is three days later, you remember the sermon better than I do, and I preached it. Like, you are just so encouraging. You are so good with your words. You're so good at this, right? I think this is how... God is saying, that's who you are. You be who you are. You live fully into who I created you to be. And as you pursue me, those gifts are going to come alive. And you're going to take your talents, literally and figuratively, out into the world. And they're going to multiply. And then I'm going to say, well done. Come join me in my joy. Isn't that awesome? Or you could take everything God gave you and said, I know that God gave me this personality or this gift or this interest. I'm not going to use it for him. I'm going to use it for my own self-interest and I'm going to make an excuse for why I'm not putting it to work for God's kingdom. I'm just going to bury it in the ground. And we all just saw in a parable form what God's response to that is. It's the, uh, the no talent man, literally and figuratively. <laughs> He's got nothing left. Um, so I think in the waiting, we're to work, and we're to work creatively. We're to think deeply about who God made us to be, and we just go do it. I think there's one last thing I want to say, that in order to work for God, we have to stop comparing. I feel like we're like slowly becoming family a little bit, so I want to tell you something. This is a vent. There's nothing that drives me more crazy, say on like a Sunday when somebody says something like, oh man, it must be so hard to be in the ministry. And they say it in, in a voice where I'm sort of like, I thought you were like a seasoned follower of Jesus. You're in the ministry. You know that, right? That's what you do. What I do and what you do, they're exactly the same in the sense that God gave us something and we're just walking it out. Like, there's not like levels or hierarchies to this. That drives me nuts when people say that. Like, you go to your office and you just be yourself and I guarantee you God will give you an opportunity to bless somebody or be a blessing or to come into a relationship. Sometimes it'll be immediate. Sometimes it'll take 20 years. I know somebody who's praying for somebody, they said for 41 years and they just now got what they've been praying for like sometimes that's what it takes but we just we just live out who God created us to be and God takes care of what the return is he's not impressed with the return itself he's impressed with your obedience to go say I want to make a return on my investment my investment is what you gave me that's what I want to say okay we got another story I got to tell you, I'm going to be honest, every time I've ever read Matthew 25, um, this is a newer Bible, but I flipped open a, a Bible that I had for about like six or seven years before I got this newer one. And every time I went in Matthew 25, I can even see by the underlines and the highlights that those first two stories we just read, I, I almost never really read them. I underlined a few times and then I just got to this story, which seems like this is like the cherry on top that everyone jumps to. I think I text Peggy that, that I was embarrassed when I looked back. This is a big story. This is a very famous Bible chunk. A lot of people who don't even know the Bible know this one. So let's read. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Okay, so are we still waiting? Yes. 
Well, no. Jesus is saying when the waiting is over, now he's going to talk a little bit about what happens for the people who are prepared and the people who have been out there doing the work. But he's saying when the moment comes, he's not telling us when that is, but he's saying when it does come, this is what it's going to be like. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. I think I put a little, uh, a little footnote there. This is the uh, almost exact same Greek word order as go into all the nations or go preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. So this is assuming that the followers of Jesus have done the work they're called to and gone and make, made disciples. And he's saying when the time comes, he's going to collect them all. And he's going to separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, so the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I love this. Then the righteous will answer him saying, and I imagine scratching their head with this face, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So let's talk briefly about this. Why? Uh, well, let's kind of break down the mechanics of it. So we got the, we got the right and the left. And who's going on the right? The sheep. And who's going on the left? Goats. Okay. So I learned this, that this actually is a super common thing in the first century. A lot of uh, shepherds own sheep and goats. And there's various reasons that you separate them. Uh, a lot of times what I read is the, the only reason that you would really separate them because they commingle well is um, usually when somebody comes in to check them. They just want all the sheep together because sheep's anatomy is the same and goats is the same. So you just separate them so you can kind of speed check your flock. Um, over time, sheep in Judaism, especially young sheep, which are called lambs, have become kind of synonymous and taken kind of this higher uh, understanding because they are an animal that is acceptable in God's sight for sacrifice. So they kind of represent this purity, this link between humans uh, and being in right relationship with God. So this is not about goats being evil and dark. I know that becomes like a thing when metal music gets big, but that's not, I think, what this is about. It's just saying shepherds come and shepherd does what shepherd does. They split the two and make two very clear distinct groups. I think that's what this is about. One is going to go on the right, and most of you know this, in the ancient world and in honor and shame cultures still to this day, like Wanda was telling me in Afghanistan, the right is what? The honor. The honor seat. And the left is kind of, not exactly, but I think for our sake, it's kind of the shame. Um, the reason is, is you eat with your right hand and you use the restroom with your left hand before antibacterial soap. That's kind of how this goes. Okay, so right off the bat, people hear this and they think, oh, I don't know what this is about, but I don't want to be in the goat category. I want to be in the sheep category. So he says to the sheep on, on the right, come, uh, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You get to inherit a whole kingdom in the ancient world, the idea of inheritance is huge because you're working for the honor of passing this along to your, in the ancient world, your son. And this is, if you're part of the sheep group, tell me more because if I'm going to inherit a kingdom, I want to know how to get that. How many of you want to know how do you get a kingdom? And he says, and they say, uh, basically, how, how do we get that? 
And what does he say? He says, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was prison, and you came to me. By the way, I, I think I've said this. If you're um, locked in prison in the first century, they do not feed you. Um, you just are there. Uh, and you starve to death unless somebody comes to bring you food. Now, coming to bring you food sounds like, oh, there's got to be some charitable people, but we've painted this picture where more than half of the ancient world lives day to day. They don't just have food lying around. Rome is not in the business of doing food rations like they do bread lines for the poor, for prisoners. They've committed a crime. For all we care, they can rot to death in there, right? So the idea is that somebody who has done something that's terrible, that the world says you should rot in there, you cared about their humanity enough to bring them what they need to survive. And then all these people answer, what do they say? When? When do we do all those things? Okay, so we've been talking about these two stories. The first one is that you should be prepared. And the second one is that you should begin to work, right? And in both stories we've said that these people, they do these things because they recognize who God is and they just are acting out of their obedience to him. Is that good? So, what are these sheep doing? Don't just think about this story. Think about, we've been in this for 25 chapters now. So, what are they doing exactly? They are doing what they have seen Jesus do. We're his disciples. We're trying to figure it out. A good start is to just kind of like copy what he does. And so, we're going to go about life and... Jesus seemed to care deeply about the poor. He seemed to spend an inordinate amount of his time, you know, binding up the brokenhearted and the lepers and bringing healing. And so that's what we're going to do. And so they just get to work doing it. Huh? And feeding. and feeding them, yeah. So we're just going to get to work doing that. So what are they doing? They're just being obedient to what they think of as their calling, right? Then they're almost caught off guard when Jesus returns and says, welcome to the kingdom that was prepared from the foundation of the world for you. And they say, that's awesome. How do we get that? He said, I, I was hungry and you fed me. And then they say, when? And then he lets them in on kind of the secret. He says, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So why were they doing it in the first place? Simple. They were doing it out of obedience to Jesus. That's it. And they're almost caught off guard that their reward is something so significant and wonderful. The second group says this. These are the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we didn't minister to you? Then he will say to them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Yikes. By the way, um, if you're uh, following along, this is the first time, I think I've said this before, we've talked about hell and the words that get used for hell. And I've, I've kind of said this multiple times that I, I don't think the Bible ever one time just pauses and is like, let's give you a clear vision of hell now. So here's six chapters on everything. That's not how we come to that understanding. I think we come to that understanding like holistically and we pull all these teachings. But I would say that the most compelling is right here and it's that Jesus uses the word eternal to go along with whatever is opposite to being welcomed into the kingdom prepared in advance. So he says in verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So is the eternal punishment that he just said, is that the, the fire and everything? No, but we also have those scripture that have been kind of building on themselves. Okay, so 
I don't know about you, it's hard to read tone. It's hard, especially hard to read tone in text messages, isn't it? You guys ever get that problem? I saw this video, I'll, you know, uh, like if somebody's like, hey, I'll meet you there, and they write this. What does that mean? That means, that means, okay, cool, right? If somebody writes, okay, period, what does that mean? You better be pre emotionally prepared when I get there because I'm not happy with you, right? That's, it's hard, it's hard to read tone and text. That's my point. But, I could be wrong, but this is how I read the tone in this text. The goats, in my opinion, what they're saying is, when did we see you like that? If we knew there was an eternal reward for doing those things, we would do those things, right? What do they say? They say, when did we see you? You're going to have to help us with our memory because if we had seen you, we definitely would have fed you and clothed you. And Jesus says, oh, well, you had no interest in doing it for the poor. And when you had no interest in doing it for the poor and needy, you had no interest in doing it for me. Because if you truly knew who I was and you truly were being obedient to what I've called you to do and you're following my example, you would have been doing it so naturally and, and kind of like just that would have been like your second nature that you'd be caught off guard by the reward, not upset that you didn't get anything, right? There are definitely moments in my life where I can be compelled to do something I, I don't always want to do based on the reward. Anyone else? Anybody been there before? I think what Jesus is saying is that if you are trying to do this Christianity stuff for the reward, you're not getting a reward. Because there's like a built-in mechanism where you will miss it. You will be looking for what behavior do I have to modify? What box do I have to check? What ritual or spiritual stuff do I have to say in order to get to heaven? And he's saying all that stuff cannot take into account the obedience factor that you just live out of a heart that belongs to me. That's what this whole Gospel of Matthew, I think, is all about discipleship. Okay. So, um, a couple things I, I want to wrap up with. Some of you might know this. Um, how many of you um, grew up or have like a lot of history in um, the Catholic Church? A handful. Yeah, this scripture is actually um, kind of at the center of a few like monastic and, and movements um, around the world. Uh, probably the most famous person that um, said that this was their life verse. Do you know who this is? Mother Teresa. Um, Mother Teresa, and I don't know what you think about Mother Teresa or what you think about Catholicism. That's not what we're talking about right now. But she uh, moved, where, where did she minister at for decades? Calcutta, India. Yeah, one of the poorest places on the entire planet. She, uh, she moved there and she wrote these words that, um, well, I, I want to make sure I get them right if I found it. I can't, I can't find it, but she said something to the effect that um, they asked, why would you go to the poorest place on the planet? Why, why do you feel called for that? And she said, I'm looking for Jesus in his most distressing disguises. Isn't that a good quote? She said, I, I, her whole life verse was chapter 25, this story we just read. She said, I'm going to go there because I'm on the lookout for him and I don't want to miss him. Isn't that incredible? Um, I was thinking about another guy, a little bit more shock and awe. Um, this is not a, um, it's not like an endorsement of the guy. I just want to make that clear. Um, some of you may have heard of him and think like, oh, Andy reads a lot. Of, I, I do not. But this was a, one of those uh, shock and awe campaigns in the Christian world about 15 years ago. It was um, the author and kind of uh, Christian folk hero for some and heretic for others. Uh, Shane Claiborne, do you know who that is? Shane Claiborne went on a, um, a tour preaching at churches. He was kind of like this early stage kind of hippie guy, really about intentional community, really into like gardening and inner city and really cool stuff in a lot of ways. Anyways, he would be uh, invited to places to speak. But the problem was it was pre-internet. And so people would read his books and think like, wow, this man is incredible. And they would invite him and pay him exorbitant sums to come speak at their church. But they didn't know 
that he was a hippie with dreadlocks down to the backs of his knees and he sewed all of his own clothes and when I uh, saw him speak once he refused a bottle of water and said some comments about the people who harm the earth for this and can somebody take this plastic cup I carry around with me and go in the bathroom and fill me up some tap water. So that's who this guy is. So he played this nasty trick or great trick depending on who you are. He would go to these giant churches throughout the Midwest, exactly who he was. He would do a little extra makeup to try to intentionally make himself look homeless. He would show up at church and he would sit in the front row and he would just sit. And multiple times, security escorted him out, told him that you're not really welcome to be at a church like this. Maybe you can come to the food pantry or the homeless services we have. And then he would let them know, I'm actually the guy you just paid $5,000 to speak at your church this morning. And then he would get up and he would preach Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31. <laughs> so that's what this story can do to people. But I think whether you're on the Mother Teresa or the Shane Claiborne or somebody in between or on the other ends, I think the, the point is this is that in the waiting, there is action that needs to be happening. And I think, I think I wrote this down. Let me find it for you because I forgot to put in that one. Okay. I read this this week and I thought, ooh, this person is talking about the difference between being an individual disciple of Jesus and doing what humans love to do, joining a committee to deal with homelessness while doing nothing yourself. He says, the problem with trying to create such alternatives is that we seduce ourselves into believing that we are working to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, care for the sick and those in prison without knowing anyone who is hungry, naked, thirsty, a stranger, sick, or in prison. We can laugh or we can be honest and say there's a little conviction in there for me. There's probably a little for you. I think that's what Jesus is getting at. I think the goats are the type of people who would be more than glad to join a, a committee, maybe donate a little money, but they would never work with people. They would never get into a relationship with somebody who they felt was below them. They just want to solve the problem at arm's distance. Um, a couple last things. I think this is what this story kind of gets us at. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then we can wrap up. I, I think I wrote these words before, but there's these fancy theology words. They just, um, the first one is orthopraxy, and the other is orthodoxy. And you probably especially recognize um, this word. What they mean is right belief or right thought, I think for our and this means orthopraxis, so right action or right practice. And I write these up here because I, I think that how our world and our culture is set up, we often get really, really caught up with this. We have, you know, even, even to be honest with you, I, I went to seminary for five years. I'd say 80% of the classes are all about this. And personally, as I've gotten older, I realize that's not, it's not right. That's not how this should be. Because we get so caught up in, I've read this book, and I've read that book, and I quoted this theologian, and this is the right interpretation. I'm not saying those things are bad. I think those things are extremely important. But if they do not inform our actual actions, it's totally irrelevant, and frankly, I don't think God cares. I think we get caught up in this. I, I can get caught up in this. I can get like 15 episodes down a podcast about like predestination before I think like, why did I just waste 20 hours of my life in the last three months? Like, that's just honest. I think what Jesus is saying is your beliefs are great. You should have a theology that makes sense, that understands who God is. But if your understanding of who God is doesn't lead you into doing what we just read, who cares? Is that true? And I think sometimes what happens, I've, I've felt this lately. I feel like sometimes we focus on this. We, we focus on the Bible teaching, the Bible teaching, and this is what God does, and this is what God says, and those are great things. But really what people need is not another Bible verse. They just need an example of what it looks like to serve the poor. 
They need an example of what does a Christian disciple look like? Because I think what a lot of people who are not followers of Jesus are looking for is they're looking for a compelling reason why they should consider being one. And I don't think that beliefs and a lot of that stuff is overly compelling to people. I think what is compelling to people is a life lived with tenacity and creativity and joy and life where people look and say, I don't know what you have going on because I, I know that maybe you're financially struggling or maybe some things are, but you just live with such a, like a vibrancy. Why is that? It's because I'm a disciple of Jesus. That's why. I think that is compelling. I don't think it is overly compelling to tell people that you just got to read this Bible verse, man. Right? Maybe you should read this Bible verse because this is what it did to me and check this out. This is what happened. This is what God did in me. But I think people are compelled with action and lives lived for Jesus way more than mouths talking about him. That's what I would like to say. And I think that this is what this story is all about. Any last uh, questions or thoughts? Spindrift, if you're listening, you've got three weeks to give me the sponsorship I want. Yeah, <laughs> Kayla. Okay, I think I'm following you. You're, you're saying if you're living more out of your actions, you're more willing to, to hear feedback that maybe your belief is in need of some tweaking or some realignment. Yeah. 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 I, I kind of read the guy with the one talent that turns into no talents as the self-preservation guy who's got his own life. And if I bury this thing in the ground immediately, then I don't care when he comes back because I don't need to worry about it. I can just continue doing what I'm doing and do my life. Um, yeah, I think, oh, go ahead, please. They come to like grips with there's no way I'm getting out of this on my own. I need a savior. I understand that I want that, but I like I want that, but I also just want to keep doing what I'm doing with the salvation piece. I, I don't think that's Christian discipleship at all. I, I think that's kind of rooted in like our American version of like we just want a ton of numeric converts and so we go out, pray the sinner's prayer and move on. I think the Bible is Paul says like I moved in with you I worked next to you I, I was like your friend I ate at your dinner table I think that's a little bit more about it uh, as you were talking Kayla I was I was just thinking about this a bit I know people and they drive me crazy sometimes and then I always like am driving away and thinking you know what those people got some wacky beliefs but when I step back and look at what they actually do with their time I think I think that they might be more in discipleship than I am sometimes. And I think we're so obsessed with like, you got to get all the right beliefs first and then we'll tell you about the actions, right? 
Like we do things like, oh, we have this really intense discipleship class for people who have been Christians for a long time. We're going to talk about like fasting and praying and stuff, but it's only for like the really, you know what I mean? I, I, uh, I know a, a person who um, I think uh, I may have told you about this before. He, uh, he was like a brand new Christian, but he didn't have like a church community. He was trying to figure out like the church and stuff. He, he became a Christian through like a parachurch uh, organization in college. And then they let out for a summer break and he was sort of like, I don't know what to do. So he just started to read the Bible. And you know what he decided to do? He started to fast once a week. Like, this is what he was just reading the Bible and thinking, this is what I think I'm supposed to do until we return for school and then I can ask somebody who might know. But in the meantime, I'm going to fast once a week. He decided, I'm going to wake up early in the morning because there's like a scripture where Jesus wakes up very early in the morning to pray. So I'm going to start doing that. And I can remember somebody who was part of that ministry was like three months go by and the guy shows up and he's the most mature Christian in the entire group. <laughs> and why? It's because they were so so focused on the beliefs that this guy was like, I don't know what to do. I, I'll figure out the beliefs later because I don't know who to ask, but I'm going to do the action piece and then I'll ask my questions later. So I, I think sometimes we just cut it backwards. It's 737. Let me pray for you and then uh, we can keep talking as long as you'd like. But